Welcome everyone to this episode of Keto Chat. I am your host, Carol Freeman. I'm a certified nutritionist and creator of the Fast Track to Keto Success Program. I am so excited today to be here with Jenny Callahan of eatthebutter.org, and she's bringing us vibrant uh, vintage eating for vibrant health. And oh my gosh, we have so much to talk about, and this is just going to be a fun discussion. So Jenny, will you just tell us who, who you are? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I guess I'm a mom. I've, I've got four kids. Two are still home with me. Two are now in college or beyond. So I spent a lot of time cooking dinner and feeding my family. And, um, and then on top of that, I am interested in spreading the word about what I call real food, more fat eating. I have just seen too many times how the low fat diet and the low fat dietary paradigm has failed so many people and continues to cause so much struggle in actually probably most Americans lives right now. So I do what I can uh, as one person to spread the word through blogging and speaking and I do some civic outreach to trying to get the conversation going and, and get more people interested in changing the way they eat. I love the simplicity of uh, real food, more fat. Like everybody's out there arguing about which way is the best and, and all that. And I know from uh, looking over your, your website, you, you're promoting, you know, there's not one perfect diet for everybody. It depends on your goals and health, health issues and things like that. And just the simplicity of eat real food, more fat. Like there, that's what it all boils down to. Right. Yeah. I, I think, and it's, it's interesting. I, I often think, you know, the science, really, we don't know a lot. We don't know exactly why people are getting diabetes. Like we, I think all of us in the low carb community have strong opinions, but while it's all getting resolved, what we do know is things used to work a lot better, like back in the 20s, say, before we started eating so many fake fat products and before we started really emphasizing carbohydrates as the key energy source and yeah. demonizing fat. So yeah. I don't, until we figure it out, you know, why don't we just go back and just yeah. eat closer to that? Yeah. Well, so how did you get interested in all this? Um, you know, what, what's your, what's your backstory? Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I have a sort of fancy education, um, a human biology degree from Stanford. And then I went on to get my, MBA at an Ivy League school and was sort of thinking I would live a pretty corporate, um, big C-suite kind of life eventually. And it just didn't turn out that way for me. I ended up getting married and having kids and deciding to stay home with them. So um, while I was home with my um, four children, my youngest started um, vomiting all the time. And mm -hmm. He, I, we, we called him yak and come back because he would throw up and then he would just like go back to eating as if nothing had happened. Oh, and how so, old was he when this started happening? Um, he was about one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And you know, in retrospect, it was not, it was soon after I had kind of started giving him, um, supplementing breast milk because I had nursed for so long. Uh, but anyway, he, um, so he's throwing up all the time and I am just like in deal with it mode. And I'm, I've got three other small children too. And, and I'm just cleaning up the mess and I'm thinking about installing a garbage disposal in my laundry room sink. Right. These are my, oh, my yeah. problem solving thoughts. So I'm totally about managing the problem. And then I was out at dinner with my mother and, and um, there was like this really clean stranger next to me and she watched Jack like just, you know, lose it all over the table. And um, so I start like asking for rags and cleaning up and this woman, she's kind of like, I think your kid's allergic to milk, which was not, I did not want to hear this stranger giving me her quick thoughts on what was going on. But when I thought about it later, I realized that I hadn't really thought about that possibility. Mm -hmm. And even though I talked to my pediatrician, even though, you know, I had this messy problem, I, I couldn't step back and see the obvious. Well, like, let's look at what you're eating. Mm 
Mm. Um, so long story short, we pulled a bunch of allergens that are common out of Jack's diet. He stopped throwing up the next day. And this was almost a year into the daily vomitosis. So I had had a long time to have this sort of revelation, but it just hadn't happened because I was so busy managing the problem. Um, and I think that's kind of what's happened to our healthcare system. Our doctors are so busy managing diabetes, heart disease, these chronic diseases are complicated and time consuming and expensive. And so we can't even step back and try to stop them. Mm. Uh, when, whenever you hear the, the healthcare debate that's been going on in the last several months, it's all about, there's no like, oh my gosh, why are we all so sick? It's just like, well, how are we going to keep paying for this crazy yeah. amount of illness that seems to be just sort of part of life now? Um, and it just hasn't been part of life in that way for a long time. Even if you just go back to 1970, uh, people were much, much lower rates, even age adjusted rates of chronic disease. So I want to help, you know, everyone kind of have that aha moment, like, let's try something different this we don't have to live with all this illness yeah yeah well, it's so true i mean i think back to my own childhood and it was the you know the rare um you know the that you know the i'll just you know a blunt term like you know the one fat kid right like in right. the whole school yeah. whereas now it's like you know more than half of the school kids and you've got the deniers out there to just say well, we're not really fatter than we were. It's just the way that they calculate it now. And, and really, it's really a stark um, contrast. And, and um, th things have changed. <laughs> well, and, you know, I, I have a mother who she had me when she was 40. So she's a lot older than me. She grew up in the 40s. Yeah. And um, she, like, when I think about um, her and her friends um, when I was a kid, there was very little obesity. There was a lot of pudge, like a lot of people who were plump. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, really, someone who was 50 pounds overweight, not very common at all. Mm -hmm. and, and, and no, these people, like my mom would no more exercise than she would. Like she was completely sedentary except for the occasional round of golf like where she would walk the course that yeah. was sort of her exercise and i think about in my social circles people work out like crazy right so right, right. it's normal oh my normal in my world for people to work out at least an hour a day like that's just not even extreme and i so i marvel at how these suburban housewives in the 60s manage to maintain their weight with very little exercise and also they were drinking too like you know they, they weren't going to their kids soccer game they were going to a cocktail party like <laughs> so how is this possible that they were able to do you know what my generation of women there's a whole world of struggle i'm i'm over 50 you know it's it's amazing how many women over 50 have a huge struggle with their weight. It's more common than not, as you know. So, yeah. Well, and you're speaking to, you know, the whole, you know, advice we've been given people for the last, I don't know, like at least 30 years to say, well, you just need to exercise more and eat right. less. And you've got plenty of, you know, uh, proponents out there that just say like, well, the reason we're so overweight is yeah, we're eating more, but it's also because we're so sedentary now, but you're so right. Like my grandparents weren't like working out every day and, and uh, you know, had gym memberships and yoga, yoga studios and Pilates and all these other right. things. They, they, they weren't. And I remember too. So when I was a young kid, my mom worked at a restaurant. And um, so this would have been the late seventies and there was a, I remember on the menu seeing a diet plate and it, it you know, it, it kind of baffled my, boggled my mind as to, you know, what this was for, but it was, you know, a plain hamburger patty, cottage cheese, sliced tomatoes, and maybe something else I don't remember now. And I just thought that that was kind of odd that like, well, why is that a diet plate? Like why, you know, that's, you know, it looks like it's plenty of calories or something and all concepts that I didn't really even 
know much about at that time. But even, even then that far ago, like you could go to a restaurant and order a diet plate. Um, and it was this low carb approach that yeah. like you're, yeah. you said in your, your TEDx talk that this was just common knowledge back then. It was you cut out the white carbs and starches and that's how you lost weight. Right. And um, very little attention given to cutting out fat or cutting back on fat. I don't think it's not like everyone was on a ketogenic diet by any means, right. but that wasn't what you, what you watched. Um, even though fat has a lot of calories, it wasn't what you limited when you wanted to lose weight, you limited uh, sugar and starch. And we've somehow, because of the concerns about heart disease, we've managed to completely forget that as soon as saturated fat was linked to um, increase cholesterol and that linked to increased levels of heart disease, there was almost like this brainwashing and forgetting mm -hmm. of what many people know. And actually I've online, I've seen quite a few articles about the Queen Elizabeth who is about the same age as my mom. And you know, like that whole generation of women, she's still a low carber. She doesn't eat, um, very many. I'm sure she has some, but that's what she limits. Yeah. Well, and, and at that time, because people were, you know, metabolically more healthy, they didn't need to go to the extremes that we have to go to today. Right. So a ketogenic diet wasn't even necessary back then because it was just some tuning up here and there that they did. Well, right. If you don't, yeah, I think of ketogenic as kind of like the therapeutic version right. of, real food, more fat, right? Right, so right. If you need for, there's so many different reasons, whether it's losing a lot of weight or managing diabetes, or maybe it's even cancer prevention, whatever, you might need to be super strict. But I think everyone, not everyone, almost everyone could benefit from um, making at least a bit of a switch to more fat. Yeah. And that's what we're seeing in studies like Pure they're not looking at really high fat diets in that study, but they're showing that the closer you get to a balanced diet with ample fat, the healthier you are. Well, so how did you go from, okay, you discovered your son had, uh, was likely sensitive or allergic to milk and that fixed his chronic vomiting. Where, how did you go from there to, to uh, promoting real food, more fat? Very slowly. So, you know, I was really busy with four little kids. But um, so over time, I kind of went through this uh, whole food stage. Uh, that's what I call it, where, you know, I was buying quinoa pasta and all those crazy um, gluten free products that were still like cookies, <laughs> you know, and yeah. because that was my instinct was okay, if I need to give up all these foods, then I need to start buying all these specialty products. So I, I did that for a long time. And then I gradually uh, started thinking, well, does that really make sense? Like, other than the people in Peru, who ate quinoa? Like, do we, why do we suddenly need quinoa in America? Like, that is kind of weird. So I gradually just started, um, Realizing that, well, first of all, my kids' allergies subsided and I and they were able to tolerate normal amounts of, of dairy, although I never became, went back to cereal and milk or anything like that for breakfast. But um, I just started transitioning to eating like basic real food. It kind of fit with the slow food movement or the um, farmers, farm to table movement. So I started trending more in that direction and um, eating more fat. And I noticed that for myself, I was so much less hungry. Like I had spent my life being sort of to, to maintain my weight. I've never struggled with my weight, but to maintain a normal weight, I had to um, really often be hungry. Mm. And I also was working out a lot. And I just sort of decided, you know, I'm, I, I'm feeling like eating a little more fat is helping with that. And so I started doing even a little more. And um, I just, and then I started reading like Gary Tobbs and um, even 
uh, I remember reading the vegetarian myth because many women in my community were becoming vegetarians. And I, mm -hmm. I read that book and she talked in that book about the sort of the myth of saturated fat causing heart disease. And that was probably the first place I read it was in mm -hmm. her book. And so I started reading more and more and just got more and more interested in how, um, how we got to where we are. And it's, and Nina Teichel's book was excellent too. I mean, there've been so many people who've inspired me. I, f I found the omnivorous dilemma, even though I don't agree with everything Michael Pullen says, he's so, um, he had such a fresh approach and it was so interesting to start thinking about food the way he presented it in that book. So kind of piling that all together as my kids moved on to high school and I had a little more time to become active, I decided that rather than, you know, volunteering for the United Way or something like that, that I wanted to really see what I could do to help share this real food workout message. Yeah, yeah. So what did that, what did that look like in the beginning? Well, I guess I started um, doing, I spoke a couple times locally just to some other moms, which was a uh, bit of a stretch for me because I'm not like a big public speaker, but I've gotten better at it. Well, what um, was but, your initial reception? Like what was, uh, when you were talking about, you know, something that was probably making their head spin, like. Yeah, people like, it, it makes intuitive sense to them, but mm. I think there's still that concern that, you're going to have a heart attack if you eat too much butter. And, and so overcoming that, I think with, especially with mothers, they might be willing to experiment on themselves, but experiment on their children, probably not. Yeah. Yeah. So overcoming that fear of fat and, you know, the more science that comes out to help us do that, the better. Um, but I, I, and I think like, for example, that, that work that um, came out um, it on, I don't know if you li ever listened to podcasts, but Malcolm Gladwell's popular podcast, Revolutionist History, he mm. just did a piece on the varied studies that were really well done in the 60s and 70s that compared eating butter to corn oil and, sh and showed that the people eating the butter actually lived longer and had fewer heart events. Yes. So like that kind of um, buried work that is being resurrected. And now because of that podcast, more everyday people are going to hear about that. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think that that is what is going to make people more open to hearing what I have to say. And I also think that ha hearing me, speak might help them actually be more open to, to hearing what someone else has to say in three years, you know? Yeah. yeah. Because I think it's just contrary enough. It might be something you have to hear 10 times before you're able to really hear it. Um, yeah. So I think that's part of the challenge to the low carb community and the paleo community, all, all the kind of alternative real food communities. We have to just keep, talking because people at first aren't all going to be able to hear us right yeah even if it kind of makes intuitive sense they're they're going to be afraid because of the science and then you have the american heart association just digging in their heels you know <laughs> this summer and coming out with that new advisory saying oh no we aren't kidding you saturated fat really is bad for you <laughs> and then backing it up with just nonsense if you're mm. if you take the time to read the the details um but most people don't read the details they read the headline mm -hmm. and so it's you know it's sort of one step forward one step back and and so it goes yeah it's like the the day and age of our current social media is like the worst game of telephone ever, right? Because it's like you take the sound bite and then everybody goes, yep, I agree with that. And then they share it to their 300 or a thousand friends. And, and then everybody goes, yeah, I saw that article. It's like, no, you read the headline that somebody posted about it. You didn't read, the, you didn't actually read it or. Right. Right. And science is so intimidating. I mean, I, you know, I had a science background, so like I can read a study and it's not a big deal. But for a lot of people, not only is it um, intimidating, it's boring. 
and mm -hmm. and it's the language is it's like reading a legal document if you're not used to that it's it's a jargonistic complicated thing when i share articles i tend to share on my blog or, or on facebook and twitter i tend to share news articles more than the actual studies mm. not yeah, be yeah. just because that's what people can read more easily the the summary that the journalist creates even if it isn't perfect it, it's it's going to be more accessible to to the average person who isn't making this part of their daily life you know um, yeah. So I think we have a communication problem because it's very technical. The, the amount of science you need to understand to understand the question of whether even like cholesterol actually has any link to, to uh, heart disease, like that's a complicated question in and of itself. And, um, and so how do we communicate a, a pretty complicated matter in a soundbite that someone is going to share on Facebook really hard. Yes. Yeah. So true. So true. So, so I wonder like, what is your underlying, like what's your underlying passion? Like why is this so important um, of a, a mission and passion? Why are you so passionate about getting the word out and helping people learn the, the truth of how they can really be healthy? I, I, I think, well, part of it is just as a, um, former business person, like the money question, how is the United States as a nation going to survive if they don't have a, a dramatic decrease in chronic disease? I mean, the rates have been increasing. It just gets more and more expensive. And yes, we're getting better at keeping people comfortable and living and extending life, but that costs a lot of money. And, mm -hmm. and, the more sophisticated the treatment, the more money, you know, the new diabetes drugs, ridiculous. They might be a little bit better than insulin in terms of outcomes, but who can afford that? You know, can we as a nation afford to have half of our population pre-diabetic, which we do right now, um, on the road to diabetes? So I'm, I'm really like concerned about our country in that regard. But also I think just as a mother and a woman, like to, for to see so many people struggling with their weight and then, oh, guess what? Blaming themselves mm. because that's the narrative, right? If you're fat, it's your fault. Yeah. It's because you eat too much or you don't move enough and you should have more willpower. Well, that is so convenient for the people who've set up us up for this failure and it infuriates me yeah, and, yeah. and if you're going to give people crappy advice and then blame them for their bad results like that's just beyond mean in in my opinion and um although i don't think it's been intentional like i'm not a conspiratorial thinker it's just so unfortunate so what can we do to reach that 40 year old mom who's starting, her metabolism is slowing down. She's put on 50 pounds and she's pouring herself orange juice and special K with skim milk for breakfast. Yeah, we're making a, a smoothie with, you know, lots of sugar and everything yeah. else. And I mean, yeah. Oh my gosh. You're, is that, I, I so agree with that, 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 you know, that's the population of people that I work with is these middle-aged women that, they have more strength and tenacity and willpower than, than anyone who's been thin their entire life. Right. Like they, right. like how much, how much willpower does it take to start yet one more diet? We're going to feel hungry and tired and miserable the whole time. Like right. that's willpower. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And I just think like the human suffering, um, the, from being sick is huge. Like the death and, you know, all the extra people suffering with type 2 diabetes, which has huge life um, affecting outcomes, right? Like amputations. This is not a walk in the park. Mm -hmm. um, not to mention their kids who have to then, you know, follow them around and take their wheelchair out of the trunk. Like it's, there's so much suffering from the illness, but also just being overweight in a culture obsessed with 
looking great on Instagram, <laughs> it's a bummer. And yeah, like the yeah. suffering and the self blame that is going on, not just with women, but men and, and kids. Yeah. Like, it's crazy. It's so sad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so speaking of kids, I'll transition a little bit, but I want to talk to you about, um, you know, as a mom, I mean, with four kids, let's talk about this whole culture of, you know, sugar and treats and snacks and, and how that's, you know, how we show love and, and how we, you know, how we, we're a good mom, if we can provide all those things for our kids and, um, you know, what do you, what, I'm sure that was a transition for you to go from, you know, yeah. what you, how are you originally raising your kids as young? Like, um, what's your, I don't, I don't even know the question I should ask about that, but what, you know, what's your, your thoughts on that? How about we'll just start there? <laughs> well, I think like one thing that like, it's, it comes down to personality and I'm pretty strong personality, but I decided I didn't want to be like the freak mom who was sending in um, the gluten-free stuff if I didn't have to be, right? So once I didn't have an acute issue, I have tried to let my kids um, who are metabolically healthy um, make some of their own choices from the beginning. But in our house where I'm in charge, the rules are a little different. So one of the things I we were strict about even before this was soda, like just no soda in the house. And the exception for that is if you're having a birthday party, we'll get some soda for you and your friends, you know, but so no soda in the house. And then when you're out to dinner with me, <laughs> if you want soda, then that's your dessert. So mm. like, it's your choice. You, I'm not going to say you can't have one for we're out at this nice meal, but then, then you won't have dessert. So choose. Yeah. And I think like for me teaching kids that soda is dessert mm -hmm. is a life lesson that even if they drink a lot of soda when they're 16, because they're always away from me and they're, you know, they're constantly at friends' houses who have a pantry stocked with it. They're just going to, in their heads have learned that life lesson that soda is dessert. Um, and so with carbs in general, um, I run, I would say a moderate low carb kitchen in my house, not keto. And um, so when I'm eating my bunless hamburger with a big salad and avocado and you know, cheese or whatever delicious toppings that are real food that I'm putting on it. Um, there's a frozen bun in the freezer, you know, a white hamburger bun from Giant Eagle, the supermarket, nothing. It's not whole grain and, you know, it's, it's cheap and it's quick. And if you want that to put on your hamburger to make it more fun for you, you know, have at your bad self. Like that <laughs> is the attitude in our house. So, I find that the girls tend to be more worried about their weight and they're also probably following my lead more. They um, don't usually have a bun with their hamburger. Um, the boys, I have a couple of football playing, trying to weigh 250 pound boys. So they will often have a bun, but when they go back for the second burger, they'll often not. So, you know, they are making their own decisions and I keep the house full of healthy options. And then there are things that I would never eat, like that hamburger bun available to them if they make that choice. So I think, you know, if I had a kid who was struggling with weight or pre-diabetes markers, I might handle things differently. I might not have that hamburger bun in the freezer. I don't know. I don't, yeah. I don't know, but that's been kind of how I've navigated it. And um, I also think that um, part of what is going on is we're teaching our kids to eat in a way that actually works for most of them when they're 15 or 17, right? The cereal for breakfast, lots of juice, have a Gatorade, honey, you've, worked out for an hour god forbid you get dehydrated <laughs> that actually works 
when you're 16 and you're playing soccer every day and, you know, but it sets you for failure when, you know, you, you're 30 and your wife has a baby and suddenly you have no time to go to the gym and your, your metabolism is changing too. It, it doesn't work anymore. And so we, we end up seeing this, just this march of, of young adults moving from lean to obese between 20 and 40, right? Which is painful for mothers, I think, to, mm. to realize that they've taught their kids inadvertently to eat in this way that is gonna make them obese and diabetic as they get older. So it's, but it's what we're being told to do. Right, right. So it's, it's hard, it's, it's a really tough problem. And, and I think the more we can just kind of get back to basics and real whole food mm -hmm. um, and teach kids that um, the, the more they'll be equipped to deal with what happens when their metabolism starts slowing down or their activity levels drop as they become older. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, a lot of parents have the perspective of like, well, they're, they're young and they can, uh, they can get away with it now. So let's just eat them, whatever they give them, whatever they want right now. And then later, Later we'll fix that, or later if they've got right. a problem, we'll fix it. But the truth is, it's really setting the stage. Like these things we're talking about, these chronic disease take decades to develop. And so what they are eating in their teenage years, I think is even more important because if they eat well, and, and like your modeling as well, is like mostly health food, whole foods and occasionally this or that other thing, re refined thing, that maintains that metabolic health and that flexibility that then... Yeah. You know, your your kids likely when they're adults, they're probably not going to have uh, the problems that most of America is having because they've mostly eaten healthfully. They've set the stage for lifelong good health that way. Right. And when they start to struggle, they're not going to think, oh, I should buy um, nonfat milk instead of 2%. <laughs> Like, you know what I mean? Cause they're going to look, they're going to look back and, and say, Oh God, my crazy mother who was putting butter in her coffee, like maybe I should try that, you know? Yeah. And so, but, but I agree with you, like um, the culture of sugar for children in America is depressing and, um, and it's, it's, it's daunting. It's hard to eat, um, I mean, you can, you can do it. We go out all the time. I, you know, we eat at fast food restaurants. Like it's possible, but you have to buck the trend to not be getting a ton of carbs and a ton of sugar every single day. Um, and it sort of makes you a Grinch if you are grossed out by the cupcakes that the other mom brought to kindergarten, you know? And I think some of that has gotten better. I've noticed over my, um, time like I, I I think the kindergarten teachers are started saying starting to say you know please don't bring in cupcakes like it, it's always somebody's birthday and we just can't have that all the time um, but I but I but still the culture of of what is normal and healthy and you'll see like the children's hospital having pizza and soda night to raise money for some Run right. and it's just like it's like there's no connection between the crappy food we're eating and the illness that we're seeing, which is yeah. unfortunate. Yeah. Well, I wanted to, I got a really good question from somebody at um, KetoCon recently here in Austin, Texas. Not here. I don't live there. There. Yeah, there. <laughs> Austin, yeah. Texas. Um, so after I spoke, one of the moms came up to me and she says that you know, I've made a big paradigm shift in my own health. Like I've really realized how, you know, toxic and, and, you know, bad quote unquote sugar is for me. And so I've completely changed the way that I'm eating. I don't eat that stuff anymore. And she follows, you know, low carb ketogenic way of eating. But she says, what I struggle with is that, um, you know, that, you know, she's got, I think she had four kids too. And, and she says, you know, I struggle with like, how do I now, you know, tell them what they can and can't have? Because up to this point, it was all legal. And now that I'm making it off bounds for me, and she said, it, you know, it was a struggle for her that she could actually, you know, have that in the house and it made her really want to eat it. And so she struggled with, you know, okay, so if I say like, we, you're not allowed to have this in the house, but then they take their allowance and go down to the convenience store 
And, um, you know, do I let them eat it in their room? Uh, do I say they can't bring it in the house? Um, and so she says, I don't know how to balance this. Uh, you know, I feel like I'm making them closet secret binge eaters. And yeah. um, so she was like, what do you, what do you think about that? And I thought it was, what's well, really complex topic. So I thought I'd pose that to you and see what your thoughts are. Yeah. I, I, so I'm hearing kind of a couple things going on in there. One is that um, she's worried about being too restrictive and causing her kids to be closet eaters. And then the other is kind of like, how do I, maintain my regimen when I have to have all these cheat foods in the house to keep my kids happy. Yeah. And, um, so taking the first one first, I think um, one of the reasons like that I don't tell my kids you can never have soda is the same instinct that um, I don't want them to be hiding it and um, binging at friends' houses. So allowing some amount um, has made sense to me for that reason, but it doesn't mean um, it doesn't mean you have to have Sunny D in your fridge. Like the, the, you can, you, I think you have to distinguish between like creating a healthy food environment and becoming like the food crazy lady, right? Mm -hmm. So I, everyone knows their kids better than I would know someone's kid. And, and, and also kids change over time and at different ages, they're gonna respond differently and can be reasoned with differently. <laughs> so I think you kind of have to use your judgment, but I, but I think it's like this give and take, like having um, them understand that sugar and refined carbohydrates should be minimized. And, um, and, and maybe right now you can have a few more of them than you'll, than you'll be able to when when you're older and not as active, like that's like it, having them understand that basic idea so that they understand the construct of why you, why you're not allowing them to have soda in the house. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that you have to remember they're going to get the food pyramid at school, right? So my kids will come home usually in hysterics laughing about what they heard about, you know, <laughs> no, no butter, no, you know, like you, you, all the low saturated fat messages at school, um, which is just until the USDA changes the dietary guidelines, that is what the schools are going to teach. So you need to, you need to have a voice in this and, and teach them what you think they should be eating. But I think balancing with your kids stage and personality, how restrictive you actually are. Now, the second question is it okay if I just roll into that of, oh, of sure, like yeah. how to manage um, that in, in the house. Um, I've actually got a few strategies that I use for this because I'm human. Like I like chocolate, you know, and like I, if if I had to have, um, you know, something that I really love around all the time sitting on the counter, that that is really hard. And one of the things I do is like my kids like ice cream and, and I don't. So I can have ice cream in the freezer and not be tempted at all, yet they have a normal kid treat that they can have, you know, I don't let them have them at every night, but you know, but they can have a couple times a week for dessert, ice cream, it's there. Um, so I think that's one strategy is picking things that you don't really like, but that your kids do <laughs> and having those as your kids treats. The other thing is if, if you go, if you're away from dinner, like if your kids are eating without you for some reason, if you're leaving a meal for them um, and mashed potatoes is your favorite thing, um, maybe they can have mashed potatoes that night that you're not home. Like maybe the babysitter can make it or maybe you can buy some small portion of pre-made mashed potatoes from the grocery store and leave it for them. But then you're not, you don't have this like pot of deliciousness sitting in your fridge that's going to tempt you. Um, so I, I definitely do that. If there's something that I find like biscuits, I think are really delicious. And so I just don't have them, but, but I have some in the freezer and the kids can heat them up if you know i'm not around <laughs> so I, I think those sorts of tricks might might help her a little bit and um also having things that 
obviously um, are really delicious, but are also very low carb mm. to like super dark chocolate or a fat bomb or, you know, some of the keto desserts that there are lots of recipes for online to make um, are helpful too. Cause kids, you know, kids live with cream. Yeah. Yeah. So that, and that can be a win-win. You can make some, you can have some, they can have some. Yeah. Well, and, and kids are, are born with a fat tooth more than they are a sweet tooth. And so they really, I find if you put out those high fat things, they're, they're going to think they taste good. Like, oh, I, I heard, yeah. I heard it. Uh, I don't think it was your Ted talk, but another one I was listening to this morning. And then I heard this again. Actually, I think, oh, it was the same mom actually at, at KetoCon that was telling me how um, <laughs> the, the Ted talk was talking about how the mom made broccoli with butter and, That's neat. Yeah. That okay. Was okay. Yeah. And, the, and t- you want to tell that story? Oh, sure. So I had spoken to a group of moms recently, and in my neighborhood, like in my neighborhood, so I knew some of them. I didn't know all of them, but I knew some of them. And I, I kind of gave my put butter. Don't you know? Like go back to basics. Eat real food. Don't be shy about the fat. And she is. A, this mom was a really good cook, and she went home. And instead of using Pam to cook broccoli for her family, yeah. which is what had been her habit because she was trying to limit saturated fat, she made it with butter and she served it up. So her teenage daughter and I actually know the girl, so it was just even more funny for me. But her teenage daughter takes one bite and she's like, "Oh my God, mom, what did you do to this broccoli? <laughs> it's like the best broccoli you've ever made." And um, she, the, the mom was kind of like, okay, <laughs> because you're right. Like, it's really good. Like broccoli made with butter. You don't have to bribe your kids to eat, <laughs> eat it, right? Steam broccoli or spray pan on it. Yeah, you might. And, yeah. <laughs> and um, so, and then the, of course the irony, the ultimate irony is the butter on the broccoli is allowing your child to absorb all those fat soluble vitamins in the broccoli. So they're getting more out of the broccoli because you put the butter on it. And, you know, um, so it's just amazing. I do think kids love fat, but I will say I, the thing I hear often when I talk about uh, adding fat is that they will say, moms will say, my kids are so used to skim milk that even if I try to give them 2%, they, they think it like it makes them gag. They oh. think it's um, gross. And <laughs> cause it's thicker and it just, it's different. Right. Yeah. So I do think that there's some things that take time. Like you need to introduce slowly. For example, if your child is balking on, at the, to, at the whole milk, you come on with whole milk, they're used to skim. Maybe you need to go to 1% for a while and then 2% and kind of gradually and eventually they'll hit a point where they'll be like, could I pour some heavy cream in my whole milk mom? But you know, like, I don't think it's necessarily people, the the kids who are really eating low fat, it takes an adjustment a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I very early in my, well, my young adulthood and my early parenthood, it was skim milk because that was the healthiest thing to do. But my son, like anytime we had any half and half in the house or mostly probably would have just been half and half. He would just, he would drink as much as he could. And it was, you know, and mayonnaise like straight out of the jar. He just always has loved fat. And then when we finally, finally, you know, I went keto and, and then he jumped on with me as well. He's like, he now like will pile mayonnaise on whatever he's eating. And, and he says, mom, why have you kept this from me my whole life? Like, this tastes so good to me. So he was, he was born like, he never lost that, <laughs> that fat. That's, even though yeah, I told my, it. my kids like to remind me of what I used to, you know, say when they were little. Um, and this summer we had corn on the cob um, a couple of times as a treat. And the rule with, at my house now is when you have corn in the cob, you know, you need to put a lot of butter on it. And it, the idea is to kind of dilute the carbs. Mm. So maybe you only have half an ear if you're me or one ear if you're my kids. Whereas when we used to have corn in the cob, no butter was allowed mm. and they would have two ears, right? Yeah. They get all these carbs and no fat. And now they get a little bit of carbs, but they get 
the fat with it to slow down the absorption and you know so it, it is funny the things that that they like to kind of come back at you with your the, the sins of the past that you <laughs> yeah, and I yeah. Said to them, well i'm evolving too you know i didn't know any better i thought i was being a good mom telling you not to put butter on your corn <laughs> you know I, so yeah yeah well um i'm wondering um Gosh, was there one other one other thought about that? Oh, the oh yeah. So that late the lady's um, comment along those lines then was how her teenage daughter was telling her how like she just wasn't a good cook, and then once she started adding in fat into her food, her daughter says, "Oh my gosh, mom, you're like such a good cook now." And she's like, "I'm <laughs> making the same things. I just add some butter to it now. Like I didn't like." <laughs> Prove my culinary skills at all and her daughter's I like know. oh no mom you're a great cook now right it's like yeah when in doubt add butter it'll yeah. taste better yeah no yeah. that's great yeah I, I think that's true i think and also it's and interestingly not just better but i think it can make cooking easier i think some of the low-fat dishes are very especially when you're trying to use a lot of legumes and whole grains that have to be soaked and but like I, I just think, you know, what I call it the original fast food, like fry a pork chop, you know, put some, melt some butter on frozen peas. I know if you're keto, you're not going to be eating frozen peas, but, um, you know, pour some olive oil on greens. Like the fat makes it not only tastier, but I think sometimes it just makes it easier and faster yeah. to make dinner, which right. got like, you know, I, I really care about feeding my family, but it is a slog. I mean, night after night after night. And then, you know, you, then they, all they say when they get up from school is what's for dinner. Like it, it never stops. Right. So to the extent you can make it a little bit easier and, and faster by using um, fat to cook with that, like, great. Yeah. You can, you can make it fast and easy and tasty all at the same time. Right. It's like an added bonus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Jenny, I'm wondering, you know, as we wrap this up, was there anything else you were hoping I would ask you about or anything else that you, you know, um, wanted to get out there? Sure. Well, uh, I guess, you know, I, I you mentioned my TEDx, which, um, is one of the things I'm trying to share right now. I have, I made a, an animated short that's on the landing right on my website. If you go to eat the butter.org, you okay. see it. It's two and a half minutes. It's not laugh out loud funny, but it's kind of amusing. And it's really the whole idea of vintage eating and real food, more fat in, in I think a pretty digestible, fun format. So if any of your listeners would like to check that out and then maybe share it, I think it's a great way to talk to someone uh, who isn't already on the bandwagon about yeah. some of these ideas. Okay. I think that's one of my um, goals is not just to talk to other people who are already discovered this, but it's obviously to find people who are struggling with the low fat paradigm and try to convince them that it's actually reasonable mm -hmm. and reasonably safe to try uh, low carb as an option or paleo yeah. or whatever, you know, you want, um, mm -hmm. whatever suits your taste and stuff. So I, I think um, sharing that video would be great. And um, I have a little grocery shopping video trying to show how yummy, like, your cart can look like when you do a, a mostly keto or low carb grocery shop. Yeah. I think that's, that's less than a minute. It's set to music, no words. It's very shareable. So I'd really appreciate it if any of your um, yeah. would we'll, share those pieces. We'll link them in the show notes down below. And so those will be easy for anybody watching now to, to, to grab that and share that. That's great. Right. Fun yeah. little tools. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. The other thing I do, which um, takes a reasonable amount of time is kind of staying up to date with all the studies that are coming out and the news articles and important um, authors, new books and stuff like that. So I do kind of a little news roundup once a month. Um, and it, if you're interested in getting it in your mailbox, you can subscribe or you can just see it on my site. Um, okay. But it's, uh, but it's interesting how much news there really is about, um, 
food and specifically alternative approaches to eating and why they might make sense. Mm. So every day there are articles and, you know, there, um, there are studies coming out at certainly every month, important studies coming out showing us that we should be perhaps a little more skeptical of our dietary guidelines than we are. Yet I think as a, we, as a realist, I look at what's going on with the dietary guidelines in DC, and I think it's great to try to do some change making there, but it is such a quagmire. I mean, Carol, the chances that we're going to get real movement from policymakers in Washington quickly, I, I just don't have a ton of hope. So this grassroots approach, which you're doing with your site and which I'm trying to do with my site, is really how how we need to um, get the word out. So if if it's helpful to any of your listeners to have kind of a news summary to share with their friends or just to stay up to date themselves, yeah, it's there, and I'm happy to happy to share it with them for free. So great, yeah. Oh, thanks for doing that work. I'm going to get on that list too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Jenny, one final question for you. Um, the meteor is coming at the earth today. Um, we're all going to die. It's the last day on earth. What is going to be your final meal? Oh, my final meal. Wow. Yeah, probably steak with a lot of butter melted on it. And then I love vegetables too. So a salad with lots of olive oil and vinegar on it. And then maybe, maybe like some, Broccoli with lots of butter, cauliflower, something like that. But also, I have to say chocolate. There would okay. have to be chocolate. I'm a huge chocolate fan. So. Maybe some mashed potatoes and biscuits too? Or, uh, no, I really know. No. Okay. I've really gotten past that. And um, I, I think the, <laughs> the maybe like if I were to, the, I tend to cheat more with like, it might be a cookie instead of dark, like nine, instead of 90% dark, it's 70 70 percent you know or something like that it would be yeah. probably more the sugar than the mashed potatoes but. okay yeah well thank you so much for being here this has been great i love talking to you we so could much. probably talk for all day long and really appreciate it we'll uh link all the information you're talking about here in the show notes and if you're watching this and you liked it give us a thumbs up subscribe if you want to see more of this um that's all for now and we'll see you on the next episode thanks for watching great. bye thanks, Carol. take care